Today's lecture, which, uh, as I mentioned, has become a legendary, legendary lecture on the internet as 21 Evils of Inflation. It got published, that same lecture, on hundreds of websites. It has been seen well over 20,000 uh, times on the internet. Uh, it has become a fairly cult lecture for a decent reason. I have worked hard to compile 22 different effects of inflation, which, to the best of my expert knowledge on inflation, no one in the, world's, in the world has ever done. I have compiled it from a large number of books, sources, and whatnot to get to this nice, clean uh, set. But I got a completely different email uh, today from just 10 minutes ago uh, from a Bulgarian guy about this so-called catch-up inflation. Uh, there is no such concept. The such concept was invented by, so let me talk about five minutes to explain stuff, because this is brilliant propaganda, all right? So you gotta understand the propaganda. You gotta, you, you gotta tell, that's the job here. Tell the truth. Uh, you know, tell the difference between reality and myth. So, as we were supposed to get in the European Union in 2006 especially, there were uh, pretty much a lot of Bulgarian economies kind of like forecasted that Bulgarian prices will rise substantially to become so much closer to European Union prices. And this was kind of like named a kind of like a catch-up inflation because our prices are so low and they are so high, and we'll experience one time shot to go up to their uh, prices. And guess what? They had a name for it: catch-up inflation. Well. I've been studying inflation for 10 years. I'm a fairly decent scholar in the subject of inflation, and I had never heard about catch-up inflation than from our genius uh, economists. Again, you got to understand, inflation is a beloved topic of hundreds, probably thousands of economists. Again, trade, international trade is a topic which has been started from um, the the beginning of economics, uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo has written a lot of, about international trade. For well over 200 years, economists have been digging deep into international trade as uh, you know, trade barriers fell and Britain began to trade and whatnot. So, hundreds, meaning century after century of experience, thousands after thousands of economists, and get this, no one ever saw this happening in history, no one, no one ever suspected this could happen, no one ever wrote about it, I and mean, again, thousands of economists and centuries, couple of hundred years of experience, and suddenly, Bulgarian economic genius comes along in 2006 and invents this brand new type of inflation, catch-up inflation. Well, of course, that's absurd, and of course, this is not right. And now, here's the interesting part. I'm getting this email from a guy who says, uh, uh, look, Professor, I understand, and I heard what you said, that it's uh, uh, false, and of course, there isn't such, but to me, it seems to be perfectly true and correct. He says, I'm not an economist, I'm quite an amateur, I've never had real solid economics, but to me, you get country A and country B uh, trading with product Y and product Z, and as they get to trade between themselves, somehow prices will go up. Well, first of all, uh, you, you got to understand, 200 years people write about this is chapter one in international trade, and it's called comparative advantage. You're going to go next semester and study trade, this is what you're going to study. Well, again, same old question I ask them, how do you think chapter one in international trade, all the great economists in the world never saw it, and suddenly ours saw it? Well, the answer to this question is, again, it is what is wrong 
wrong in the thinking overall is that the higher income country necessarily always implies a higher price level. This is not necessarily true. Here is the deal. A higher income country means higher productivity. And higher productivity certainly means lower, more competitive price. And if it means, well, Japan, for example, take Japan, is a very high productivity, high income country, yet Japanese cars are kind of like the cheapest in the world, possibly with some exception recently in India and recently in China. Rich country doesn't mean necessarily high prices. Japan is one example, okay? So, in the U.S., when U.S. was back in the old days, the richest country in the world, because it ain't no more, China now appears to be bigger and richer in some sense, uh, etc. I don't want to get into that. Uh, well, back then, American prices were one of the lowest in the world. You got to understand that high income comes from one and one and only one source, higher productivity. And higher productivity can come from only, will result in only one thing, lower, more competitive prices. So that thing is certainly not true. So, okay, questions? Yeah. They're coming because of... Uh, they have a lower income. A bunch of euros coming from the European Union. Yeah, sure. Well, what's the question there? So, there is no rise in productivity, but income is higher. Whose income? Um, government. Yeah, so government spends more. Well, <laughs> just, just because the government has more income today, where, where, where is it going to get the income? Uh, I mean, you got to understand. If you gotta have income, it must be produced. Of course, if it's the government, someone still has to produce it in order for the government to get 42% out of it. Income is not coming out of the sky. It's not coming out of the blue. It is coming out of hard, efficient, productive work. And someone's gotta produce it first in order for the government to take it. All right? Well, it, it, are, are you implying that Europeans are saying, oh, here's a whole bunch of money, and we're just going to give it to the Bulgarian government, which, through corruption practices, will appropriate it for themselves? Europeans aren't that stupid. They're smarter than that to give, you know, <laughs> to give a lot of money to a corrupt government. Well, the reality is actually quite the opposite. Europeans are cutting off viciously all of our programs because they get to see that we're corrupt and we're not going to change. Well, we got problems with morals, all right? But I mean, it's a different story altogether. So, now, what, what, what is it? So, you got country uh, A here, country B here, and then you have uh, good uh, X and good Y, and then you have good X and you have good Y, and the presumption is that, well, this one is, uh, let's call this the poor country, whatever it means, and this is the rich country, whatever it means, and uh, this has a competitive advantage, so you have here export, again, I'm getting myself in trouble with international trade, but the problem is still inflation, all right, so... Uh, I'm still today on the topic of inflation. And here you have export. Well, the idea is that if you're exporting here, why prices will be going up? And the answer is yes, certainly some wine prices will be going up. But here is the deal, guys. When X is exported to you know, increase the X consumption here, the price of X will go down. Just look at what happened at car prices in Bulgaria. Car prices are going actually down, despite phenomenal massive inflation and of everything else, all right? So, it is not necessary, when you're actually importing, some prices will fall down. Actually, think of it completely differently. You had with opening trade between the United States and China 
one of the biggest trade flows in human civilization? Well, because the two economies merge, like we merge with the EU, does this mean phenomenal wild inflation in the United States? And a couple of thousand, tens of thousand American economies were just plain dumb and stupid and they couldn't even see it? Is it likely? No. no, of course not. But our Bulgarian geniuses saw it and forecast? Of course not. International trade and entering a larger area brings in competitive advantages so that now that we are in Europe, we can actually import cheaper olive oil from Greece. Let's see what you got. For example, if like this product is uh, uh, like low, has low prices, but we can sell this product abroad by high prices, so I will export this. Yes. So if this product has very high prices in my country, that's why we will import from other countries. The cheaper one. Yeah. Yes. So if, uh, yes, so if our product is cheap, we will export abroad, and of course, it will remove some of the product in our country and it will raise some our prices. Alright, is that part clear? But if they are much more productive and much more competitive wherever we are not, of course our prices will be a lot higher. We call this non-competitive prices. And of course they're going to drive dramatically lower our non-competitive prices. So, now let me get to the point. It is not that the US has uh, 20,000 dumb economists who didn't see this. The reality is completely different. The reality is that this merging and opening up of trade with China did not bring rising prices. Certainly not for those goods, in, those goods that are coming from China. Uh, calculators, uh, DVD digital recorders, uh, VCRs, DVD players, TVs, you name it, whatever you're importing from China, it has a strongly disinflationary or deflationary effect on prices. It is not saying anything about monetary policy. It is just saying that the US TV, well, they haven't been producing for a while, uh, it was expensive. Now it's coming from China, it's driving the price lower. You had a nice uh, little uh, calculators, they're coming from China at five times lower price. You had some watches, well, they're coming from China at three times lower price. So, trade drives prices lower. All right, so is this now fairly clear? Does it make a lot of sense? It is not that, oh, 20,000 people didn't see it, or, oh, that Bulgarian economy is special. It is completely different stuff. But it is interesting to have to understand that you get amateurs to, you know, to have this theory appeal to them and to sound right. And that's got to be bugging you, you know. A lot of economists never saw it, and they never developed. There is no such thing as catch-up theory. Well, here's interesting. One guy actually went up and did a lot of research on the internet and found that someone else had developed it. But guess what? It was like in 2003 when it was applied to Poland. So, actually, a Polish economist saw it for the first time in 2003 and developed it and whatnot. And still, economists never saw it for uh, two, three hundred years. And now, big... Well, what about this situation? U.S. and Mexico, they got themselves into a trade union, exactly like we have now in the European Union. Well, did it result in massive inflation in Mexico? Well, the answer is no. When you have other states like Porto or Puerto Rico, however you want to call it. Again, this hasn't been always observed in history, but now apparently they see or know or understand that inflation is coming on the horizon. Let's just blame it on the Europeans, right? Let's blame it on someone else. We're going to crank out like a uh, 8 billion Bulgarian leather through the printing press 
and we're just going to blame it on the Europeans. You got to understand, it's so easy, it's so convenient. It, well, it's just we just blame it on the accession to Europe rather than you know pointing the finger at you know whoever you're supposed to point and say it is your fault. Instead, they do the exact opposite. They say, our central bank is performing the greatest monetary policy one has ever seen in the history of the world, you know? We're rock solid. We have all this kind of stuff. They're just cranking money at 30% a year. <laughs> and they say that's okay because how much money you print doesn't matter anymore. Well, why don't they let me print then? All right? <laughs> but they wouldn't, you know? They print, but they use the money first and they benefit first. But they tell you it doesn't matter because money supply doesn't matter anymore. Of course, that's pure government propaganda. I mean, you can't just double the money supply and it will have no effect on the price of coffee or whatever you're buying, glasses, uh, pens, whatever. Of course, it's going to drive prices high for everything. And of course, it's going to drive your currency lower. I mean, this is, well, solid economic theory, but it sounds like they wouldn't. Is this good enough? Is it, is it clarifying the topic? All right, let me speed up with effects from inflation uh, and see uh, if I can get them all today because I might not be able. Now, you got to understand that most of these we have already studied, so these won't be new. Uh, they will be, what I'm trying to do is provide a survey for you to understand that inflation is not without its bad consequences. So, number one, first, no positive, no positive social and economic effect. The argument here is simple. Money serves to facilitate economic trade. Whether you have one million or one billion, whatever voluntary exchange will occur between two people, it will occur with whatever the money is. If you double the money supply, it will simply not increase the service of voluntary exchange and it will not improve the benefits of trade. So, no social and no economic benefit here. Number two is the simplest of them all. Uh, prices and price level increases. It definitely hurts individuals, households, and of course businesses because it hurts also their, you know, raises also their costs. This is the most popular and the most well understood by every single person in the world simply because they gotta pay more. And when it hurts their wallet, they see it easily. Number three, distorts relative prices. Now, prices have the most important function of providing signals to economic agents. To consumers, if the price is rising, that the good is becoming scarcer. And to producers, that the good is becoming scarcer so that consumers will be consuming less of the scarcer good and at the same time provide stimulus for producers to produce more of the scarce goods. Well, when you print more money, it does not raise all prices uniformly by, let's say, 5% or by, let's say, 10%. It raises some prices first, and then second, and then third. Well, the process of inflation, which can last 6, 12 to 18 months, provides a temporary distortion of relative prices. For example, now this massive inflation which we have been undergoing for the last six years has been driving real estate prices to be a lot higher than the prices of bread or the price of pens or TVs or whatnot so that it provides the this, this, this signal to build houses. Now we have this wild manic construction, real estate construction going on, 
due to distorted relative prices. Of course, if we were printing the money in our basement and you guys were the first to, uh, you know, spend them, we're going to see a massive, uh, you know, inflation in the prices of textbooks, pens, beer, whatever else you guys consume, right? So it will suddenly, you know, before long, would have a, uh, you know, a nice prospering, let's say, beer industry in town to satisfy your, you know, drinking needs, right? So again. Relative prices get distorted, it provides the incorrect signals to producers and they will overproduce of those prices that are relatively high and ignore producing those uh, goods and services which lost in relative value to the others. Again, in relative means, hey, this price went up from 5 to 10 and this price went up from 5 to 6. Well, everyone's going to rush to produce the 10 and you'll have a relative under production of that one, which is 6. All right, so the price may have gone up in absolute terms, but in relative terms, it went down. Uh, clear questions? Let's move on. Creates risk and uncertainty. Risk refers to the probability of a bad outcome. And uncertainty again refers to the probability of a, or a chance of a bad outcome. The difference between risk and probability is that in risk you can actually estimate the probability of a bad chance. If we are flipping a coin and the coin is fair and the odds of, let's say, tails is 50%, so the chances are 50-50, and if we're gambling, we, you, me, everybody is assuming a risk, but we can estimate this risk and we can estimate it to be 50%. With uncertainty, you cannot even estimate the probability of the bad outcome. You just don't know what it is and you can't estimate what it is. So, in terms of risk and uncertainty, economic agents become generally more cautious. What does it mean? If you're a consumer and there is general risk and uncertainty, you begin to behave differently than normally. If you're in business, You'll get to invest a little bit less. Well, we don't know what's going on. We don't know if there's going to be financial stability or banking stability, how much prices are going to rise, how much my costs are going to rise. So, rising risk and uncertainty makes businessmen cautious and makes them invest relatively less. In certain times, when businesses are more confident, they invest a lot more with all the good positive implications uh, from that. So, five, income diffusion effect. Well, the income diffusion effect is what I have already covered a few lectures ago. This is simply the inflation process where the early inflators benefit at the expense of the later, uh, uh, of the later inflators. So that's the uh, income uh, diffusion effect. It has strictly redistributive uh, nature. It has the, infl the nature of the inflation tax with all of its negative uh, consequences. Number six is a consequence or tightly related to five. It benefits the inflators. Nothing new, nothing surprising. We have already covered it. Who are the inflators? Well, number one, the central bank. Of course, commercial banks. Of course, the government. Of course, Wall Street. And ultimately, other uh, additional benefactors, those that benefit from inflation, will be 
Wall Street banks in general and major corporations because they will borrow big money first and then they're going to be spending it down the economy. So these are the inflators. Now, it, number seven hurts fixed income groups. Okay, so what is fixed income? Fixed income simply means that that person gets a fixed or unchanging income no matter what the inflation is or no matter what the circumstances are. An example of fixed income group will be retirees. They'll be getting 120, 120, 120, no matter what. Well, sure, the government will give them a little bit at the end of a year or at the end of two years to compensate them for some inflation. Well, our university has been effectively for a long while a fixed income group as some salaries have not been updated for a couple of years. I mean, we have a ravaging inflation of 25-30% annually, officially reported by the government like 14%, and we're getting our salaries updated for a couple of years. That's an example. So, we are hurt by it. Now, the retirees get hurt by it. Another category of fixed income are those that are holders of fixed income securities, which are government bonds and corporate bonds. You bought 1,000 government bonds, you're going to get 1,000 from it, and if there is inflation, inflation will effectively extract value from you. In other words, you're going to lose uh, income because your bond is not indexed for inflation and your principal is not indexed for inflation. It was supposed to be that the nominal interest will compensate you for inflation, but inflation is higher and surprising, you get hurt and that's number seven. Number eight is hurts existing creditors. Now, it is true that commercial banks are kind of like the existing creditors, but kind of like, not quite really. When we say existing creditors, we got to have a clear meaning, and that clear meaning is that of savers. Commercial banks and financial institutions are, their nature are that of financial intermediaries. They take the money from those that save them and channel them across to those that need them. So, the intermediation processes of channeling of those who save to those who are in shortage or need them. So, Wall Street and commercial banking are not the true genuine creditors. They just channel savings funds. They are the genuine creditors only on the credit expansion. The additional money and credit which they create out of nothing. Well, that for them is a pure profit. So if they lose a little bit on the money that they created, they still gain a lot more. So who might be an existing creditor? Well, in this case, Bulgarian simple. Bulgarian ordinary common people who deposit their Bulgarian level at Bulgarian banks for like 5% interest rate when the official government inflation is 14% and every common sense Bulgarian knows that it, the real inflation is closer or around to 30%. Well, they are hurt big time. Simple as that. And all, every Bulgarian gets to understand it, alright? So, nine hurts all holders of money. Well, it simply hurts them for the simplest reason that they, their money is losing purchasing power. Well, this is, of course, the same as or equivalent to the inflation tax. 
Now, remember one thing which I explained a few lectures ago. Let me try to repeat it again without a lengthy explanation. Yes, I can get rid of my own money as I actually have. Just keep a couple of hundred in my wallet. No other Bulgarian lever. And you can and he can, but everyone in Bulgaria is impossible. We have 36 billion lever in circulation, roughly broad money supply, and they will exist. I can get rid of, you can get rid of, everybody can get rid of or try to get rid of, but in the end, they will exist and they will exist in someone's balances and everyone simultaneously cannot get rid of them. So, anyone can evade the inflation tax as I do, for example, but the whole nation as a whole will not and cannot evade the inflation tax unless they repudiate the currency, unless they say, the hell with the Bulgarian leva, I'm not going to use it anymore, and I don't give a damn because it's losing value, all right? So, until that point comes, it may, it may not come, it came in Bulgaria in 1997, which was effectively the hyperinflation. You know, when everybody tries to sell it and no one wants to get it, well, what does it mean? Supply gets, uh, you know, huge, no demand, value falls down to zero, well, value of zero for money is pretty much the equivalent mathematically to prices going up to infinity, well, it's just a hyperinflation. Well, in the course of that, some other money will emerge, whether it's Russian rubles or US dollars, unlikely, or Euro or Swiss franc, and we'll get to use some other stabler uh, currency. All right, uh, questions here? None. Uh, what is it? Ten. Increase Increase consumption investment ratio. Well, the answer is simple. If the government or whoever commercial banks create more money or credit and the credit is injected into the economy, everybody's got more money and more income to spend. So, of course, part of the new money will go to extra consumption. So, it will certainly boost consumption. But here is the trick. At the same time, because consumption is going up, savings are going down, it must be necessarily the case that investments will fall. So the result here is that consumption is going up and at the same time, investments fall. Well, some people will object possibly correctly and say, wait a minute, during an inflationary boom, inflation, oh, sorry, e e e investments rise, don't fall. And the answer is not quite true, uh, because savings fall, investments fall. There may be a boom only when you have massive capital inflows from abroad that will bring in new savings and boost the overall investments. But otherwise, it is logically and politically, oh, sorry, and economically impossible. Now, why would people still continue to believe that there is an uh, investment boom when in reality investments fall? And the answer is that inflation provides such distortions into the economy that you may get a real estate investment boom. Everybody is into construction business. Everybody is uh, constructing houses, everybody is buying, investing, speculating in houses, and everybody sees the houses. But everybody is not seeing that we're not building uh, factories for shirts. We're not building these nice, high-quality whiteboard markers, which we, uh, I think, import from Japan. Uh, they don't see that we can't produce a DVD recorder like this one we're recording this lecture with. They don't see that we're not producing shoes because mine are Italian or pants because mine are Bulgarian either. In other words, people have this uh, natural, extremely natural uh, tendency to see what is in, in front of their eyes and simply not see that thousands of other things we don't invest in. And they see, oh, there's a phenomenal real estate
estate boom and they conclude that investments are rising while in reality the exactly opposite occurs. We are not investing in anything else or in everything else investments are actually falling. Alright, so this is this type of uh, distortion that's occurring. Well, if consumption is rising and if investments are falling, uh, let's see what's 11. 11 is following directly out of 10. Lowers national savings follows immediately from above. If everyone's consuming more, it can't be that national savings are rising. They must necessarily fall. Well, lower national savings have massive negative implications, like 12. reduces economic growth. Well, first of all, I got to put in there, lowers overall investments. With investments, lower investments, it lowers productivity. So everyone was saying, oh, this is an inflationary boom, is creating phenomenal growth, but no one is realizing that if you did not have the inflationary boom, <laughs> investments will be even higher, and productivity will be even higher, and economic growth will be higher, and ultimately, standards of living would be higher. With inflation, growth, investments, productivity are lower, and standards of living are lower. They're lower than without inflation. Doesn't mean that in absolute value they fall. Again, same story. It means standard of living would have been twice higher but in, for 10 years, but instead they were only 50% higher. We are, let's just call it, relatively impoverished. We may have grown in absolute terms, but in relative, we did not do as good as we could have. 13, let's see, illusion creates the Illusion of higher and rising profits. So this applies to entrepreneurs and this applies to small businesses which seeing the inflation driving the price of their product higher, they believe that because of inflation their product, their profitability went up. But here is one example. You get, let's say, a tractor for a manufacturer, sorry, a farmer who's worth 50,000 and that farmer is using that tractor for 10 years. So for one year the, the farmer is using up approximately on a pro rata basis $5,000 for one year and $5,000 represents simply the loss a value of the tractor, which we simply call depreciation. Now, that depreciation he computes as a cost to his business. So he uses 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, and so 10 times for 10 years, 5,000. And then, at year, well, in the meantime, he's been getting, you know, his wheat price has been going higher and higher and higher. He's getting higher and higher profits. So he spends more on vacations and a bigger house and whatnot. He enjoys the bigger profits. 
Uh, so, in other words, he pays out to himself and his partners is bid at a higher price, and he has calculated ten years from now, of course, to throw this one, you know, uh, in, into sports scrap and get a tracker for fifty thousand. Well, guess what? He's shocked to find out ten years later that the tractor is no more fifty thousand, but worth now hundred thousand. It turns out that he had an illusion of higher profitability and that he had actually undersaved in the lack of money now to buy the uh, new tractor. So he's got, of course, go in debt. But didn't he actually save by buying the tractor until it was not inflation? Like when he bought a tractor for the price of 50000 Yes. And then the, this depreciation during the 10 years. Let's say like inflation started on the fifth year, and from fifth year onwards until the tenth year, he like profited from that. Yes. Because of the depreciation. What, 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 what a minute! You already assumed he profited. This is dead wrong. He I did mean, not profit. He did not profit. Like uh, he. Uh, he thought he was deluded that he was actually profiting. No. I when mean, in reality I mean, he wasn't. Had he bought uh, like a tractor in the let's say sixth year, which would cost seventy-five thousand. Yes. And for the next four years, the depreciation, depreciation would be higher. So it turns out, like for the four years, his depreciation cost was less. No, I understand, but that, but that's the point. You assume that he's perfectly rational, and you assume that he factors in all the inflation, and he assume you assume that if he sees ten percent inflation on his wheat that he will immediately factor in 10% increase in the price of his tractor. But this is not, you know, because you assume it and you're walking in this lecture that a farmer on the field will actually see this happening. Not, they will not expect that their tractor 10 years down the road would have doubled in price. That's the point. The point is that rational people get to see but many businessmen are actually under the illusion that they have higher profits when in reality they're not. They just did not impute the inflation into the cost of his tractor. So he should have imputed six, seven, eight, uh, you know, a thousand each year to factor in the new higher inflationary cost. But he did not. He's just looking at the books and said, oh, this year we made 20,000 and last year we made 15,000. He didn't realize that inflation is driving, driving his uh, revenues uh, higher, but he didn't realize that it's also driving at the same rate his cost because he didn't buy a tractor in the second year or in the third. Well, that's the idea. They get fooled about it. It's a delusion. It is not real. But when you actually walk to the store to buy a real tractor 10 years later, you realize you made a big mistake. Is this not getting any clearer? Yeah. Or not really? Again, the, the, the point is you are uh, analyzing this perfectly rational uh, guy who's getting a high world level top quality education. But those farmers didn't get your education and they never will. All right? Uh, more questions, somebody? Okay, is there any uh, solution for these poor men? <laughs> <laughs> these poor men got screwed. That was the meaning, that was the intention, that was the purpose of doing the inflation in the first place. Is that bankers, government and the inflators in general will get to extract value from them. That would mean we're not looking for a solution. They don't want the solution. They want the game going because they are benefiting in the billions. I mean, what is the solution for the farmer? Well, he should be better educated, smarter, maybe try not to sell all of his goods. I mean, he will have a lot of things to react. But then again, uh, one can react and a second can react, but everyone cannot react to the money problem because everybody cannot get rid of their money. Again, the problem is inflation and everybody can't get rid of it. Well, they could. It's hyperinflation. The bank system collapses. It's no good anyway. Uh, is there a question more? Mm, yes, but... Okay, let's try. Uh, everybody else, like, uh, okay, for example, you can, I 
predict something and yeah. for example someone else, but most of us we can't. Yes, that's the idea, that's the beauty of it. And uh, so um, That's why I got a job, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so like we're kind of losing Yes, that's the idea. The idea is that those who hold money lose. I mean, why is it surprising to you that there is a bunch of people that get together and want to you to lose so that they benefit from you and from you and from you? What would mean? What again? This is immoral. This is against our religious beliefs. This is again our, uh, against our ethics. But this is not a course in ethics. This is not a course in religion, this is not a course in morals, this is a course in economics. My job is to explain to you the economic reality. Is this thing bad? Yes. Is it evil? Yes. The lecture I called it 21 evils of inflation, that's why it's called. Can we put a moral judgment? Yes. But for now we're just considering what are the economic effects of it, you know? Uh, we say, well, what can we do for the poor people, asked the student from the other country. Well, that's a whole different story altogether. Now we're just concerned, are there good effects from inflation and are there bad effects from inflation? And which are the bad effects from inflation? Okay, and then they say, well, it's morally wrong. Sure, <laughs> what can I say? Yes, it's wrong, sure. Okay. But that's the reality. That's why they got their game going. All right? I mean, is this... Uh, again, you gotta understand, this is still economics. We're still trying to stick with, hey, are incomes going to go higher or lower? Is it going to increase productivity or lower productivity? Is it going to increase the value of money or lower the value of money? Is it going to help unemployment or hurt unemployment? we got a bunch of our variables which we're concerned with. You know, we're kind of like looking like this. And we're going to try to do what we can do. What's next? 14. Oh, consumes capital. This is interesting. Consumes capital has the meaning that, well, you got a certain house every year. You got to put in maybe two, maybe three percent of the current value of the house as a cost to maintain the house. So, 3% maintenance cost and the house maintains its value. In a boom, you, what you have is effectively that people get to consume too much and there is under or inadequate maintenance of the capital structure. An example has been recently, was it in the US that a bridge collapsed? Was it in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so, the pro uh, Minneapolis? Minneapolis, where the bridge collapsed, that's a classic example. Uh, civil engineers have been warning for a long time that these bridges, these roads, are not getting the sufficient uh, uh, capital maintenance. And when you're not maintaining, meaning you do not invest into the capital just to maintain its value, it is the same as effectively consuming the capital. Uh, for example, will be a car. One car can last for 10 years. All you got to do is change twice a year the uh, engine oil. Well, you stop maintaining the car and not change the engine oil. Within two or three years, the engine will be, and the car will be effectively dead. All right, so this is a basic maintenance which shortens dramatically the life of the capital. And therefore, if you uh, do not do adequate uh, maintenance, you, you know, lose effectively the value of the capital. For that bridge, the value went to perfect zero, right? Uh, for a car, it's going to deteriorate rapidly within two years before it gets uh, down to zero. Now, one of the other students asked an interesting question, uh, which was quite logical, but not, you know, uh, it, it had a uh, bad assumption. Well, how in the discussion can we actually consume more than we produce? Let's reproduce the example for your benefit to understand. So, we produce 1,000 and consume 800 this year. And we put in 200 wheat. So, 1,000 bushels of wheat production. You have consumption of 
800, and then you have an inventory of weight of 200, all right? Next year, we do the same. 1,000 consume, uh, sorry, produce, 800 consume. Inventory now is 400. 200 saved this year and 200 from last year, you get a 400. Well, is there any problem next year consuming 1,100 when in reality we produce only 1,000, we can consume 1,100? She simply said, we can't pr consume more than we can actually produce. The answer is, no, there is no problem. You can easily consume, but we will consume our inventories. So we can actually consume more than we can produce, and this will lower our inventory. Well, what is inventory from an economic point of view? Well, the inventory, actually if you remember our third or fourth lecture, this is just, yes, is a form of savings. But savings are, in this particular case, logically and mathematically equivalent to capital, to capital. So, essentially, if you have 500,000 or 400,000 bushels of wheat in the warehouse, it is for you capital. You can move, use it for uh, the next crop, you know, sowing the seeds for the next crop. You can use it to feed animals and get more meat out of it. You could use it to eat, you could use it in bad times to, to uh, let's say, compensate for a bad harvest, or could just consume more and, be, you know, become fat. I mean, you can use, it's capital. It is former savings, and you can do whatever you want to do with it. But it is absolutely possible, and this is the simplest example where you simply consume capital. Why would capital be consumed? Because it is likely possible that consumption will exceed actual production and you will dip into capital. That's quite likely. All right? More questions here before I move on to the uh, next, which is 15. 15 is imposing... Manual. Costs. So, what is a menu cost? Well, you got yourself a restaurant, prices went up by 2 or 3%. The owner's got to change the menu. He's got to throw this one, nice quality luxury one. He's got to throw it and make new ones. Menu cost for us, AUBG, you know, you know you guys have these nice, super quality, high quality luxury bulletins, you know, brochures, where we say how great we are, and at the end we say that the tuition uh, is 6,000. Well, guess what? We've got a throne now, because tuition is no more 6,000, inflation is raging, and we have to actually raise the tuition. I mean, you know that well. So, now we throw these brochures, and we've got to print more, we print new one. Well, this is a classic example of a manual cost. Of course, you got a car dealer, prices are rapidly rising, he's got like 500 cars, 500 price stickers on the car. Well, he's got to walk in, you know, two weeks later and change the sticker of the price of the car from 15,000 to 15,2 to compensate for uh, rising inflation. Again, this also involves the cost. The guy's got to actually take the time to change the price. He's got to actually go and print it. Well, what if you have a magazine which have a nice, uh, let's say, a nice ad with the lipstick and the good stuff and everything and says $10, oh, suddenly you got to use a new graphics designer to, to change the $10 into $12, right? <laughs> and then resend it to the magazine, then the magazine's got to change its, you know, it imposes an awful lot of additional costs. You'll say, oh, but it creates jobs, does it? No. No, the answer is yes, it does create jobs, but these jobs are inefficient. These jobs simply mean that people do things that otherwise they wouldn't do. So if these jobs are inefficient, it simply means that those people could have been doing other 
more productive things in raising their own and everybody else's standard of living. So, the point is, yes, they create jobs, but these jobs are kind of like phony jobs. They would not need it if there was no inflation. So, it diverts scarce productive resources for a non-productive use. So, this is what we call simply in economics, inefficient. So, it just causes or creates inefficiency. Uh, 15, 16, shoe leather costs. It imposes uh, shoe leather. <laughs> Uh, and here, manual costs. So, shoe leather costs refer originally to the fact that during high inflation, nominal interest rates are high, so it is worth keeping your money into the bank to earn that very high nominal interest rate, and rather than going once a month to the bank to get your money out, now you're going every week. Rather than withdraw 4000 from the bank to spend for the whole month, you withdraw 1000 for this week, you spend, and you keep gathering 3000 to earn your interest. Then the next week you withdraw 1000 and you leave the other two uh, to earn your interest. So rather than making one trip to the bank, you're making four trips to the bank. Well, if you're making four trips to the bank, your shoes, the leather of your shoes will effectively, you know, cost you. You do this uh, quite too often and suddenly you gotta buy yourself new shoes, all right? That was the original idea. The economic idea of shoe leather means that because of high inflation, people have extra cost of managing their money. They will be looking to invest in some mutual funds or they get to invest now in other things. They got to go more often to the bank. They got to search some other financial advisor. They got to do a whole bunch of other things like, oh, prices will be going higher. Let's not wait for next month to buy this uh, refrigerator, honey, let's go and buy it today. So we got paid and we leave everything else, we'll go and buy a refrigerator. And then we rush to buy a stove and then the VCR. The point is that suddenly you get to move to do a whole bunch of things that otherwise you wouldn't do or you would wait later to do at more convenient time. Well, all of these shoe leather costs, which is managing the cost of inflation, imposes additional time, effort, consumes scarce resources, which you could have done better things with it, meaning be more productive or have more fun and leisure instead of worry about your money. All right, is it clear questions? 17 is what? Causes a bracket creep, 17. Bracket creep. Well, creep, it does not refer to what's in Hollywood movies about creep is something that's scary and horror. Creep refers to a sudden move, sudden slow move from one uh, you know, point to the next point. So what is a bracket? Let me explain this on this side of the uh, board. You have, if, if you're in the US, and I'm giving you very rough numbers, they are not quite correct but they will give you the illustrate the idea. If you're making between zero and 10,000 in the US, you're paying 0% tax. If you're making from, uh, let's say, uh, 10,000 to 20,000, you're paying a 10% tax rate. Uh, again, uh, of th th these numbers might be like 7,000, 7,000, 7, this might be 18,000, all right? That's not the point. The point is for you to understand what is what and what is bracket cream. And then, if you're from 20,000 to 30,000, you're paying 20% tax, all right? So, how do we call this thing here, uh, 10 to 20? Range. How do we call it? Bracket tax. Not the bracket tax. The income bracket. The income. The income 
bracket, and this becomes not the bracket tax, becomes the becomes the tax bracket. Tax. Tax bracket. So you're making seven thousand. You wouldn't be paying any taxes. Well, if you're making fifteen thousand, suddenly you got a marginal tax rate of ten percent. I like to give this example because it's true, because it's real, because it occurred when I was nineteen ninety-five doctoral student at the Ohio State University when I was doing my PhD in economics. I was making like seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. So my income was roughly eight thousand. And when I was making roughly annual eight thousand dollars or nine thousand dollars, I was practically in the zero tax bracket. Well, uh, roughly eight nine years later, 2003, 2004, I met one of my former students before I went to the US. I was assistant professor here at Sofia University. One of my former students uh, back then actually came nine years later, well, he graduated, he got his other bachelor's, then his master's, then he worked for two years, and he went for the same PhD program there. And I was asking, hey, how much are you getting for, uh, you know, for your teaching assistantship? I mean, I was getting paid a teaching assistantship of 750 He said 1500 I said, wow, you guys are doing great. I mean, back then I was getting like 750 your money has actually doubled in nine years. You're doing so much better. And where are you living? He says, in the graduate dorm. He said, oh, I live there. I was paying $273. He says, we're paying $550. I said, oh, Jesus. Your rent went up twice. Your income went up twice. Then I'm thinking to myself, I bought my first car in early 96, and I was paying 99 cents for gasoline. Looking at the price, I just filled the same day at 210. So the price of gasoline more than double. Then I remember what's the price of bread. Bread prices had more or less double. So now I'm raising, oh Jesus. For nine years, all consumer prices went up twice, and all of his income was barely compensating for his inflation. Well, if prices went up twice and your income went up twice, are you better off or worse off or just the same? Same. Worse off. Oh, well, guys, why worse off? Oh, yeah, because the guy now has got to pay the taxes. So, his pre-tax income was the same. No, prices doubled, nominal income, pre-tax income doubled. But now, he's got to pay some taxes. So, when we asked him, well, how much you're paying in taxes, well, he was paying like almost 10 times more than what I did. Because I was paying a couple of hundred dollars, and he was paying, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. I mean, you're making 15, uh, well, 17,000 a year, you're going to pay like two or three thousand dollars tax. So, I said, wow. So, effectively, this is a classical example of a bracket creep. Well, why the creep? The creep because they were not, teaching assistantships were not 750 for nine years and suddenly they skyrocketed to 1500. That's not how it works. They were 750, they went up to 800, next year went up to 850, the next year when they, they went up to 950, <laughs> then they went up to 1050. So these incomes have been slowly but steadily creeping up. And therefore, from 8,000 to 9 to 10 to 11, you are slowly but steadily creeping up towards the bigger, higher tax bracket. Two questions, let's see. Didn't the uh, range of income bracket change correspondingly? I mean, shouldn't it be like uh, zero tax? Yes, that's exactly how it should be. But in real life, that's not how it is. Because the government is greedy and eager to get your tax money. So, they do change them, but at a, hot, at a lot slower rate. So, inflation was 10%, they'll make it uh, 20,200. They'll tell you that they adjust and adapt the bracket according to inflation, but according to which inflation? 
and the answer is according to their own governmentally reported, meaning underreported inflation. The real inflation is a lot higher. During these same years, what do you think was the inflation reported by US government for these nine years? Well, four, five. Uh, no, 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 no. Three, three, three and a half at most, more like two and a half. So that would be the average annual inflation. You accumulate it over 10 years, you're going to get 35% uh, cumulative inflation. Well, but the real was, at least for those people who actually live and got to pay and actually got to eat and got to sleep, it was 100%. Prices effectively doubled. So, yes, they may be uh, adjusting by 30%, but, you know, people didn't shift to eat dog food in order to evade inflation. They still slept in the same dorm. They were just paying twice more, okay? So, uh, what was the other question that you had? I was going to ask the same question. Okay, well, there you have the answer. Uh, let's see what's uh, next uh, 17 bracket. Creep number 18. How much time do we have, guys? Is it time to go? Yes. Three minutes. Three minutes? Huh? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's, let's draw the line here. Uh, again, there is no rush. We'll finish off uh, next time. Let's turn it off, okay?